Welcome to the Sales Mindset Podcast. I am here as always with Brian to talk about all things sales and the right mindset for the right kind of success that you want. Brian, we got a question today? Amen. Yeah, so today the topic is actually a pretty pretty simple one, the age-old saying, practice makes perfect. Mm. How would okay. you apply that to sales? Absolutely. So I've been reading a book, and I can't remember the title. I guess I should put it in the show notes. But I've been reading a book that's talking about mastery and how you have to master something. And it really fits in with grit, which is a topic that Angela Duckworth has done a substantial amount of research on. And grit has been identified as this thing, this personality trait, if you will, that is key to success for anyone, whether they're in sales, whether they're in anything else. Hmm. And it's the same thing. It's about practicing and it's about doing things regularly. And so what really matters when it comes to practice makes perfect is how are you beating on your craft, to use a phrase that Will Smith actually used um, several years ago in an interview. And what it means is that essentially you can't wait till the end of the quarter to do all your sales because you'll be out of practice. For it. Yeah, yeah. You can't wait until the end of the week, really. You should be spacing your calls out so that you're regularly doing your calls, regularly having the conversations, practicing active listening, mm -hmm. practicing handling rejections and objections and, and whatnot. But even within that cell, even within that, if you're part of a sales organization and you've got peers, practicing with them, role-playing with them. If you're a sales manager, creating this culture of practice. Yeah. And it, it also relates to another personality trait of coachability. Are you sitting down and looking to identify where your biggest deficiencies are, handling objections, active listening, remembering people's names? And are you role-playing those situations with your colleagues? Or are you putting it off as long as possible? Mm -hmm. Still getting it done in the amount of time you're supposed to do it, but still putting it off. Yeah. And the idea of practice is you need to make daily habits for what you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best way, I'm going to take it out of sales for, for a second. The best way I can represent this is learning a foreign language on five minutes a day. And I know I've spoken to this, yeah, about yeah. this before, but... You know, for especially for the viewers or listeners who have never tuned in before, you know, I've learned Duolingo by just doing it five minutes a day, and I yeah, maintain yeah. it. You can fall out of practice too. Yeah, yeah. And the key thing to remember there is, even a small amount of time each day practicing. If you've got scripts, practicing your scripts. You know, I hate scripts, but yeah, you know, that's going to make you a much better salesperson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually just crossed the eighty-two day mark on my Duolingo streak. And cheers. Yeah. It's big, mm -hmm. big today. Uh, kind of going back to what you're saying about practice. It's the idea of practice and constant exposure, mm -hmm. where even if you're not necessarily getting better measurably every time, or you don't notice that you're getting better, that constant exposure is twofold, where mm -hmm. one, you're are, you are constantly practicing and marginally getting better, even if it's not noticed, or maybe you have a big leap or a big discovery one day. Mm -hmm. And also, it becomes part of the routine and it becomes easier. Yes. And I think that's honestly the even more important side for at least me, like my personality, where I'm really good at saving things until the last minute, figuring out how to maximize the time that I'm not doing it. And I've found that the hardest part of a task, and this is backed i i wish i could reference anything but the hardest part of a task is starting it mm. like getting over the hurdle of actually beginning it mm -hmm. and that's why habits are so important setting up daily habits where they're part of your general routine they become so much easier and you don't have to think about them as much mm -hmm. and with sales or really anything but in specifically the context of sales it's a socially taxing thing or it can be anyway especially if you're out of practice and you're uncomfortable if you build it into your routine where i'm calling this many people each day and you build it as a habit that you're not dreading or you're thinking about. It's just part of the the everyday. Then it becomes way less taxing. Mm -hmm. uh, I've found that doing sales like underprepared or phoning it in or like cramming it or something, it comes down to like I'm stressing about it beforehand, and then I maybe didn't do enough, and then I'm stressing about it afterwards, thinking I might not hit the metrics, thinking I didn't do a good enough job, and not being properly warm. And also having energy sapped for other things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's that's related to um, 
an area of research. Some people will use ego depletion theory. There's other related areas where mm -hmm. you you do expend mental effort. Mm -hmm. uh, our brains are much like our muscles. So fortunately, if you if you go to the gym regularly, you will eventually start to see results. Yeah. Right. Uh, even if it takes a little while to really perceive those results, mm -hmm. you'll see them. Or if you don't see someone for two or three weeks, they will make a comment. Blinked in the yeah, chance, yeah. Last week, right? Uh, the mind and the brain have the same reaction. Yeah. There are certain areas of our brains that will grow, like the hippocampus. And then there are certain areas of our brains that what will happen is they'll rewire themselves mm -hmm. to account for the new habits the new communication techniques and whatnot that you're, you're engaging in. And so the challenge there is when you're talking about sales and learning sales scripts or learning your, your sales routines or handling objections or anything, you're not going to see the results until the end of the quarter when mm -hmm. you see your conversion rate. Go yeah. Up, yeah. When you see that you're hitting quota or as most people probably want, as you see checks coming into your banking. Yeah. Account. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why everyday effort is so important. For one, those checks are a bit bigger and those quotas look nicer, mm -hmm. but also you will see the direct effect of it as you go, mm -hmm. where maybe you don't see the money yet or the, what do you call it, the results of it, but you do see the building of the process where you're making relationships and you're closing a deal or, well, building a relationship, you're yeah. building up your, your contacts. But even other aspects of the sales process, if you think about researching your your clients mm. beforehand. Yeah. So, you know, if you go on to Apollo.ai or if you're going to Zoom Info, or whatever yeah. database you're pulling your information from, are you just pulling that information and blasting out emails? Mm -hmm. or are you taking it, looking each individual up, doing some yeah. research on those individuals, which is harder at first because mm -hmm. you don't have a research flow, so to speak, yeah. to discover what you need to do in terms of, Oh, here's their LinkedIn. Here's their Facebook profile shows they're they're yeah. married. Great. Uh, whatever you need to do to build rapport, to have an opening line mm -hmm. that catches their attention as directed directly at them. Yeah, that's something that also requires that practice. Mm -hmm. And so, however you're spending your particular days to do that, are you you know if you're selling three days a week, are you doing your pre-approach research the other two days of the week? Or yeah, are you just sitting there looking at your computer? dreading doing it. Yeah. Uh, and and so every aspect of this, including follow-up, including emails and whatnot, you see a daily practice. Yeah, definitely. I think that one thing that I struggle with is I find that, or instinctually, I think the research and prospecting part is less important mm -hmm. just by instinct or like less fruitful. And I know it's not true logically. You know, I try not to let it affect the process, but you don't get the same level of pressure or perceived success when you find what you need to to build your case mm -hmm. to approach a client mm -hmm. as opposed to making the approach itself. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I just want to sit there and just like look up phone numbers and just dial and call because it feels like I'm being more efficient with my time. Mm. And I think another that's another part of the daily practice and being patient and watching things develop. If you trust yourself in the process of however you distribute it, whether you do uh, like you broke down two days and three days or mm -hmm. you split your days in half mm -hmm. for how you do it. If you stick to a process, you can feel as though you're building everything congruently. Yeah. And it can be hard, especially if, if like, why am I doing this research? Why am yeah, I yeah. looking up these, these nuanced things that are just... That no one seems to be responding to because yeah. it takes time before you're going to get those hits, mm -hmm. um, and it can be can be very challenging. And it's also pieces of the process don't don't seem to be necessarily related. I'm going to go back to that fitness, the the fitness metaphor, if you will, again. Yeah, and the idea of well, abs are made in the kitchen, not in the gym. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the real hard one. I'm I'm just feeling this hunger all the time. Mm -hmm. instead of, okay, I know that this this hunger is artificial in some cases because yeah. I'm just programmed to eating at certain times and programmed to eating more than maybe I need to eat, as most of us are. Um, and so that that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I've been recently getting through, too, is I try to lose the uh, the um, little spare tire yeah. <laughs> as, it, as it goes. 
But uh, same thing in sales. There's a lot of seemingly unrelated processes in sales that can that can be frustrating. Yeah, that uh, you're you want to get through, and you just want to understand that uh, or trust that it's part of that process. Yeah, I think that is why it's so neglected. Is that neglected? Is that it's a less glamorous part of the process, and sometimes it does feel pointless, like mm-hmm. we said, where why do I need to know if they're married? Like, what does that mm-hmm. change? Or why do I need to know this? And sometimes there is one specific thing that you can connect to, like, oh, they went to the same university as me, yeah. or they play a sport that I also play. But a lot of times there might not be. Mm-hmm. It's not about finding the one thing to connect with them. It's getting a general idea as to who the person you're going to be talking to is. Yeah. And that changes the way you go into a conversation, you continue a conversation. Because your framework is going to shift when you start talking to somebody. But sales is about making friends. It's making friends the job. Yeah. Theoretically. And then you're doing that to establish the trust. Yeah. So that you can push on them. Because mm-hmm. so, I, I want to, you know, I'm thinking challenger as you said that. Yeah. Right. The challenger approach, understanding that you're going to need to push clients into discomfort sometimes yeah. to see that they need to change. They're not going to do that for someone who they don't trust. Yeah. And that they don't know. Yeah. 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 And nothing more awkward than saying, so are you married to someone who just got a divorce? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So sometimes there's some value to going out there mm-hmm. and getting a little stalkery on people. Yeah, sure. And it kind of it does kind of feel like stalking sometimes when you start tearing apart their their personal life. But the minute that you set the meeting, they're going to be doing the same thing, mm-hmm. assuming they're in- act- actively interested in the sale and they maybe want to make something happen. They're going to say, what is Kanaz? Who is this person? Yeah, yeah. Who's Brian? Who is yeah, I, I'm going to look into this. So clean up your social media, yeah. this, folks. <laughs> and having just a general idea. You don't need to go and, you know, dig on the dark web for who they are, but have an idea of who you're sitting down and talking to. Yeah, it's the same thing when you go to someone's office. Yeah. You know, in old traditional sales, if they weren't inside sales and you weren't on the phone, you're going to go in their office. You're going to look around. You're going to say, oh. I see a wedding picture. They must be married. I yeah. see pictures of them at the golf course. They must like golf. Or if you walked into my office, you would see pictures from when I was in triathlon. So mm-hmm. that's that's something that if someone's like, oh, I see this, that must mean that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what you're doing, and again, this is all part of the process. We're just, you know, talking about getting practice and doing that, is assessing their personality as well. Is this person, you know, um, you know I, I obviously like DISC, and so is this person a dominant personality? Yeah. And am I going to have to be quick and to the point and goal oriented with them? Mm-hmm. Or are they a more of an I and based on their social media, based on what I see in their office, am I yeah. going to be able to have a quick conversation and at the same time manage that rapport so that mm-hmm. they don't waste my time and the time meeting time yeah. by just gabbing it up mm-hmm. with me. So uh there's all sorts of things and you want to really just assess that personality. There's even some AI tool, Crystal Nose, I think is what it's called, that you can buy that will a lot basically skim someone's LinkedIn profile mm-hmm. and give you an idea as to where they sit on the disc. Oh, really? That's kind of that's kind of crazy. Which, which can help you construct the right kind of email to them. Yeah. Again, that's that's another thing that's practice. How do I construct an email for someone that's going to appeal? Yeah. That's going to speak to their types of personality. Mm-hmm. Wow, I didn't even know about that. AI is crazy. It is. It is. And it's been around for at least four years now. Oh, really? So this is this is nothing new. Yeah. It's fairly accurate at really assessing where someone might stand yeah. on uh, the disk profile. We should try to remember to link that in the chat. Outer, oh, yeah, absolutely. Or, or the, the description. Yeah. I think that one thing that can kind of slip away is considering your own disk profile when you go into a sale Mm -hmm. where at least the way that I see it is if you're there to build a relationship and establish a rapport, make a connection, you can't just go in and morph your personality to fit and talk to a person uh, for your own gain. And I think that is something that is misunderstood about salespeople, whether it be from the outside of sales or or, uh, amateur salespeople where I'm going to be who I need to be to close the sale or I'm going to go in and build this relationship or I'm going to get them to do this thing while what you're saying is skim their LinkedIn with AI or with your own eye and determine who they are yeah, yeah. <laughs> with your own eye get an idea of who they are and then know who you are as yeah. well so you can have a conversation with them where yeah no so, uh, sorry I didn't I was just thinking and um, yeah you want to be authentic yeah is what you're saying yeah and for me like 
I think everybody has different elements of their personality. Like I, I can be very like monotone and direct about things, but also I'm a pretty social person. So if you have an idea that somebody is a little bit more outgoing and sociable and you go into it, it's like, yo, let's channel kind of more of that side of the personality and just have a fun conversation where we build rapport and get to know the person. Mm -hmm. Or if it's more of a dominant personality type, you know, kind of maybe use your strengths in that area to have a conversation. Like consider what you can actually do to make friends with that person. I, I agree with most of what you're saying, but you have to have some caution and make sure that you're respecting the type of personality that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if they are a D, a lot of people, if you're dealing with someone who's yeah. purchasing, they're probably high D. But if they are a high D, you want to make sure that you're not going too yeah, yeah. with the I. If they are high C or high S, that's going to involve or inform, excuse me, probably some of the questions that mm -hmm. you would necessarily ask. It might not affect the rapport so much. Yeah. But down the line, what matters to them is definitely going to be affected by that. You know, if they're not, if they're very uh, compliant, if they're very stable, that makes them very risk averse. Mm -hmm. And obviously you're going to need to speak to that, especially when you're presenting stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it's, uh, you're the writer and the client is the director. Basically. Where you're going in, you want to not cater your pitch necessarily to every aspect of their world because you have your own business to look after mm -hmm. but go in understand who you're dealing with and cater what you're doing to their needs while also putting yourself forward yeah i'd say the word craft right, right. because they're still going to have questions they're yeah. still going to want more information but you want to make sure that you're learning how to appeal to what matters to them mm -hmm. Oh, high D goal oriented, high S or C could be risk aversion. High yeah. I might care more about how they're perceived. Yeah. As an example. And and, and it goes much deeper than that. So so don't uh don't come at me in the comments of uh, <laughs> if, if they're like that's overly simplistic. It is yeah. very overly simplistic. So and it's about being an adaptive salesperson. Mm-hmm. Right. And again, same thing, practicing doing that, yeah. practicing and having conversations with people who are that different types of personality. That's why you want to join networking groups so that you yeah. have more experience going out there and talking to people. And again, that's part of the practice. Yeah. If you're an ex if you're an introvert, mm -hmm. introverts actually can do very, very good at sales. Yeah. They they just not need to recharge their battery in a different yeah. way than an extrovert would do. But those introverts just are probably going to be a little bit more to the point and, and obviously have to work a little harder in those social situations. Mm -hmm. But the best part of that is those introverts aren't going to gab about themselves. Yeah, time. yeah. I think that's that's a it's a keynote that introverted doesn't mean shy per mm -hmm. se. It doesn't it doesn't mean that you're going to go in and not know what to say. It's just the difference between being an actively social person and somebody who needs to recharge their batteries here and there after social situations. I, I heard the um, analogy or as a metaphor where an extrovert, I don't remember who I heard. It, it might have been Simon Sinek, um, where he's saying that extroverts, they start the day with so many coins and then introverts um, start the Extroverts start the day with no coins. Introverts start the day with a bunch of coins. And social interactions build the bank of the extrovert while introverts will spend it throughout the day. Yes, exactly. And yeah. um, that's related to what I talked about earlier with that ego depletion theory. Yeah. If you're an extrovert, you're recharging by being around people. Mm -hmm. I tend to lean more towards extroversion. Mm -hmm. And so I, if I'll go out to a bar or a coffee shop to work because just being around the people will recharge me or at least keep me at a base level. Yeah. Introvert, the exact opposite, being around those people would take from their battery uh, and they'd have to recharge by going away. I I said I'd lean that way. I might be a little bit more ambivert at the end of the semester because I'm, I have so much yeah. contact, I actually need to take some time away mm. to recharge. And that's, that's that's again, probably the fact that I, I can swing both ways in terms of extroversion and introversion, mm -hmm. depending on where I happen to be in in my contact with other people. Sure. Fair enough. Well, a little bit of a, a tangent at the end there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I, you know, I could probably go for a long time on personality and yeah. sales, but that's the general point is that everything you do is, is a practice and everything... Mm that you practice will eventually not necessarily make perfect, but you will start to master certain aspects of yeah. that. And a piece of that is also that you have to put yourself in some areas of discomfort if 
you're not used to things. Mm -hmm. And so go do it, go practice, make sure that you have a regular schedule when it comes to your, your role plays, when it comes to your cold calls and your outreaches and in your research and you'll be successful. Any final really? thoughts on that? No. Well, to end on a, on, on, on a proverb, per perfection is a pursuit, not a destination. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great way to end okay. it. <laughs> we'll catch you next time.